Okay, so without further ado, um, I'm going to welcome uh, Lakshmi Rengarajan. No, I did Rengarajan. I'm sorry. Either one. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get this right. Uh, uh, to come up and speak uh, on the topic we're all dating all the time. Um, she's director of event design at Match, a role that arose after she founded and developed singles events and a storytelling platform called Me So Far. Um, in many ways, Me So Far was a deep ethnographic dive into the modern dating world. Among its goals was to create a space in the dating world with an emphasis on personal stories and in-person interaction. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to have us all welcome Lakshmi. Thank you. Is this working? You can yeah, hear me? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of things today. Uh, I'm going to talk about event design. I'm going to talk about conversation. What I'm not going to talk about is um, online dating hacks and advice. So if anybody was here for that express reason, that is not going to be talked about tonight. Um, I'm really interested in what happens after you meet someone or how you meet someone in person. So um, you see that my title is Director of Event Design, so I'm super interested and passionate about how places are structured to maximize conversation and um, the chance for people to really connect. So my first act of event design tonight, I came in, I saw you guys were all spread out. That breaks my heart. Um, so uh, I mean, unless it's really, if it's very important to you to sit in the back, that's totally fine. I'm not going to force anybody, but if you could, if you wouldn't, if you're, in the first six rows, if you could just switch wherever you're sitting, and if you're not in the first six rows, if you could make your way up towards the first six rows. If it's really important to you and you don't want to move, that's fine, but if there's any part of you that's open to it, I would love for you to come to the first six rows. Okay, awesome, and we're gonna interact a couple times tonight, so I really appreciate you guys moving. Um, now, one of, the, one of the reasons I did that was, is a couple, but I mean, a lot of my job is getting people out of maybe what their habit might be, um, especially at events. People tend to show up with friends, people that they know, and yet they're coming to an event to meet new people. And that very choice that they made to sort of grip onto somebody is actually going to prevent them from their goal. And even if it's not an expressed goal, um, people go to events um, to meet people. And it's really hard to break out of that if you, if you, you know, if people don't actually create active opportunities for you to get out of your habit or to get out of your default behaviors. And so something as simple, as simple as asking someone to change their seat can completely redefine the outcome of an evening. So, I mean, I think all of you, you know, anyone who's been to a dinner party has had that experience of being in a conversation and you're not really sure how to get out of it, and you're gonna do the polite thing. You're gonna stay in it, you're gonna be near the artichoke dip or whatever it is that you've decided to be at. And little things like that, like just giving people a reason to change their geographic location is one of the very, very simple things that goes into event design. So um, uh, here's a quick rundown of kind of what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about a lot of different topics. I'm gonna to talk mostly about what I learned prior to match because um, all, of, all of that is kind of what informs my job now. Um, so I'm going to tell you about how I got interested in the dating space. Um, a, little, a few insights on dating today. It's a really, really fascinating category and one that keeps changing. Um, what event design is and how it pertains to singles events. And then obviously the name of this talk is we're all dating all the time. So the lessons and, um, you know, sort of core understandings are applied throughout, throughout categories and throughout different, different parts of our lives. And I really, really want to appreciate anyone who's not single for being here. I think a lot of times when people see, oh, there's this woman from Match coming and she's going to talk about dating, they think that they need to be single or they think they have nothing to learn from something. But the truth of the matter is, it is true, we are all dating all the time. And what I mean by that is if you've ever, you know, whether you're single or not, if you've been in that position where you're trying to show somebody who you are, whether that's at a job or you're meeting your in-laws or you're talking to your child, that sort of discomfort where you've got this, all this stuff inside that you want to you bring out but you're not sure when or how or how it's going to be received, that, that is the experience of dating. And that is something that we all experience regardless of our relationship status. And that's sort of the big point that I want to make today. Um, 
The other thing is that um, there's a really big difference between event planning and event design. Event planning to me is the logistics. Totally important. You need to make sure that you have lights, you need to make sure you have a tablecloth, flowers, you know, that the programs are printed. But to me, um, event design is a level below that. It is how do you want people to behave when they're at this event? What is the intended outcome? What are the conversations that you hope will happen? And that is something that is totally different, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. And you know, it's, it, it's relevant to birthday parties, and it's relevant to conferences. So what do you want people to actually experience while they're in your space? I'm just going to say that one more time. OK. So before I get into kind of all the, the lessons that I brought to match and how I think they can apply to you, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So the one thing is that um, I think whenever someone hears that someone organizes singles events, that there's some kind of like woman about the town and they know everybody. And that is absolutely not true. I was not, you know, that friend that set everybody up. I was not that person that went on 10 dates a week, not at all. Um, and so my journey to dating is kind of circuitous and, and, and is, not, is not linear by any means. Um, so I went to college, like a lot of people, right out of high school. Um, and then I dropped out and I um, became a bartender. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that because it actually has, has relevance. Um, so I went to college and, you know, I was a good, good student, you know, Indian immigrant child, all that good stuff. And then I dropped out. So parents were not happy. But... Um, <laughs> One of the re I dropped out for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons was I had a really, really hard time connecting with people. I could, you know, talk to them, but I couldn't just, I couldn't hang with people. I don't know how else, to, I feel like that's the easiest thing. And in college, there's a lot of hanging. And if you can't hang, it's kind of hard to get through college. <laughs> so I, you know, dropped out and, you know, definitely, definitely felt isolated. And I figured that one of, maybe one of the ways to get over this was to become a bartender because I would have to talk to people all day long over and over and over and over and over and over and over and, over, and maybe that would help. So um, I kept bartending. I went back to school um, after several years of bartending and got the diploma and all of that. Um, went back to bartending um, because that became like my, that ended up becoming sort of my comfort space. Um, and then I went and got, you know, a job in a building where you get like lunch and post-it notes and Sharpies and things like that and insurance and all those things I'd never had before, which are lovely, by the way. Um, and so it was just a little bit later in my life that I sort of experienced the, the, um, the, the warm embrace of corporate life, I'll call it. <laughs> and um, what's, what's interesting is what I learned is why the bartending thing is relevant and why it actually eventually connects to dating is um, one of the things that's really, really painful about dating today is this phenomenon that we call small talk. And it's not just in dating, but it's particularly poignant in dating. You meet someone new, and what happens is you reach for the topics that are the closest, you know, and that ends up being th shit that's really boring, like where you work or what the weather is like or traffic. And it literally feels constructive. I mean, I think everyone knows that when you're in a conversation and you know that this person's probably interesting and you're probably interesting, but you just, there's just, you're just staying in these topics. And here's the thing. If you did small talk all day as a bartender, you would go crazy. Like you could not do this for eight, an eight hour shift, just having random like small talk with people. What you learn to do as a bartender is you learn to do something. It's very different actually. I think these two terms get confused, but you learn to shoot the shit. And shooting the shit is very, very different from small talk. Shooting the shit is what you do with your friends. You're very familiar with this. You talk to your friends. You don't have a conversational agenda. You just talk about whatever's around you. But it's fun, right? You talk about, you know, the burrito. You talk about Game of Thrones. You might play cards. And you just start making whatever is around you interesting. And you know, everyone knows that feeling, right? Everyone knows what I'm talking about. I see a lot of heads. Okay. So shooting the shit is very different from small talk. But... It takes different things in order to understand the difference and to be able to do it. So um, I talked about how my title is Director of Event Design. And I just started calling myself a designer about maybe two years ago. And before, um, I, I worked in, you know, I worked in um, advertising. And I thought the only people that could call themselves designers were people who knew the Adobe Suite. It's like, no, I, you know, th those are the only people. 
Um, and I know I, I'm in a different crowd here and you get it, but like for a lot of us, like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's scary to call yourself a designer. And so I, you know, realized that like, yes, for some designers, this sign would be really annoying. That doesn't bother me. Um, if you are a very organized person, that's not my desk. I want to make that clear, but that could be my desk. Um, I just throw things in different places. Doesn't really bother me. And then, you know, kerning and letting, if you're not a designer and you don't understand things like that, doesn't bother you. But if you're a designer, like this might actually induce vomit, like depending on how serious you are about things. Um, but what I realized is being a designer is that you start to develop this acute sense for something, whatever that thing is. And it doesn't matter what it is. It's like you start to see things that other people don't see. And this is, the, this is the kind of designer that I am. So, you know, I, told, I talked about how this stuff can drive some people crazy. This is what drives me crazy. When I go into a space and people are just sprawling and they're apparently there to meet people, but there's nothing being done to orchestrate that or to truly facilitate that or to build structures around it. So one of my biggest pet peeves is when I go to a conference and people have paid a lot of money to be there the space is expensive, there's so much waste, and they're like, and make sure you meet people. There's a lot of interesting, accomplished people in the room. And it's like, how are you supposed to do that? Especially if you're not super outgoing, and especially if you're in this big conference space, it's actually really, really hard. And I always thought it was strange that people sort of take that stuff for granted. They're like, oh, make sure you network. Like, that's actually a really, really difficult thing. And then obviously, you know, being a bartender, I think it's interesting that people go to bars to meet people because bars are actually not designed to help you meet. They are designed to sell alcohol. And I think it's sort of the irony that people think that bars are a good place to meet. They're great for hanging out with people you already know and you could meet somebody, but that being the intention of a bar, I don't, I don't actually think is what most of them are designed to do. Um, so this is the stuff that makes my skin crawl. Like when I walk into a room and I'm just like, oh my God, I, I, you know, everyone's here, everyone has an objective here and it's not being serviced right now. So now I'm gonna shift a little bit into the project that I started that got me interested in the single space and sort of the convergence of insights um, that led me to, to um, my, my company slash project called Me So Far. So this was back in 2009. And this was my personal introduction to this sort of explosion of the slideshow storytelling format. Things like TED, South by Southwest, Pachaka Shama, you guys are all familiar with that. But um, what was interesting is like, while the, the, the structure of it was really beautiful, this idea of someone getting up and telling their story via slides, in order to get one of these coveted spots, you had to be either super accomplished or a really good public speaker. And most people are neither, but that doesn't mean that they're not worth getting to know. And so I thought there's something interesting about this. Could we make it more accessible? Could we make it accessible to the introvert, to the person who didn't, didn't have that polished linear narrative? How could we make this a little bit more um, open to a broader range of people? Um, and then I was really observing the dating world and talking to a lot of, a lot of couples um, and people who were dating. And there's several insights I'm, I'm going to, to illustrate, but this is to me, um, the one that I think is sort of like the key one. So I think um, this is how attraction often takes place. You meet someone, you know, you meet them again. They're like, oh, hey. Um, and then the little, you know, the, the little feelings of romance kind of slowly trickle up. So I think a lot of us know that, like we, we've experienced that or we've seen it happen. So we know that that's often how attraction takes place. However, this is how we date. Right? It's someone says one thing that wasn't on that list or was on your deal breaker list and it's over. And so how we meet or how we date isn't actually aligned with how attraction often happens. And I think we've all had, I've yet to be in an audience where people don't know this phenomenon that I'm describing. You know, you, you meet someone and, you know, one day it's just, oh, that's Bob, he works in finance. And then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks later, you're like, I can't stop thinking about Bob. Like, what is that? You know, like, what is that? Like, just sort of like all of a sudden this person like physically looks different to you. And that phenomenon was what I was really interested in. 
And it's not just how we evaluate people. Even when we do go on a date, we are, first dates are just weird. You know, they can be great, but they're also often weird. You're in this weird vortex of small talk. You're talking about those topics that aren't very interesting. A well-intentioned pitch, just trying to fit in that you have a PhD. Um, and life's biggest questions, you gotta tell everybody what your reproductive five-year plan is. You know, and it's just this very, very sort of toxic soup that's really hard to, to navigate. And even if you do, you know, go out and date with someone, you're very likely at a coffee shop or at a bar, and you're looking at this person, and you're literally like sitting in judgment of them. And again, you're, you're reaching for those tried and true topics. And what's interesting about you is actually locked in the back. And it never really makes its way forward because you are often, like I said, reaching for those things that you, that you know that are sort of safe and seem like good filters and all that. And that takes me to another insight, is that attraction is often a realization that you have, that you develop over time, not a decision that you make. And a lot of dating is very decision-based, not realization-based. And I was interested in the conditions that people can have a realization. And we know this story. We know this is, we, we've all had this experience because when we, when we see it in popular culture, we, we, we know it. So Chandler and Monica, right, and friends, took them five seasons till they finally realized that they had feelings for each other. Um, Jim and Pam in the office, you know, working together, see, growing, growing that attraction. And then my favorite, obviously, is Cher from Clueless, right? So the last 20 minutes of the movie, she finally realizes, oh my God, I've been in love with my stepbrother this whole time and I had no idea. But the reason why we don't balk at these or think that they're far-fetched is because we know them. We have all had that experience of someone slowly creeping into our hearts and realizing, wow, that's someone I would like to get to know more about. So as I was sort of laying out the different types of attraction, um, there was instant attraction. I think we all know that. That does happen. You hit it off with someone. You just think they're fantastic. You, you know, um, The compa compatibility, which is sort of like the more like science-driven thing where you have so much in common with someone. You're the same religion. You have the same pedigree. Um, you, know, you have the same number of siblings. Just everything just kind of matches up mathematically. And then there was this thing in the middle that I called gradual attraction, that thing that creeps up on you. And that, to me, was super interesting. And that, to me, is what I wanted to design for. I'm like, people are doing the, the, the other two. That's, that's in the bag. This thing in the middle, that's super interesting. How can we design for that? And the other way I like to talk about it is I think that we have designed for this, the instant spark. You know, the fireworks, we all know what that is. But how would you design for the simmer? How would you design for the slow burn? And that's, that's, that's where I got super interested. So another sort of key insight is that it's easy to meet, but it's hard to connect. It's probably easier today than ever to meet people. And I think that's why so many people who are dating get frustrated because they're like, I went on 87 dates last month. And I'm like, yeah, but that's just, that's just, a, that's just pure quantity. Um, the difference between meeting and connecting is massive. And they are totally different. Meeting versus connecting totally different, and that space in between is where I think design can go a long way to bridging the gap. Um, another theory, and this, this can be held by many people, but it tends to be held by a lot of men that I talk to, that um, num like dating is a pure numbers game. Just plow through enough women and eventually the right one will show up. And I, I, think, that there, I think that dating, there are elements to where dating is a numbers game, but I believe that dating is truly a numbers and an environment game. The, the place, the, the, the environment in which you meet somebody is just as important as anything else because people are different depending on their, on their environment. Think about someone who you meet in a coffee shop versus someone you would meet at you know, the gym versus someone you would meet at a conference. Same person, totally different sides of their personality, and that's key. Next insight is that how you meet is as important as who you meet. Right? I think we're very focused on the who, the age, the what they look like, the do we have enough things in common, but no one is really talking about the how. Well, how did you meet? What were the circumstances under which you met? Because if you just sat there in judgment of each other, that is going to impact the version of the person that you meet. So how do you, how do you design for that? So um, 
my design challenge in, in this area was to delay judgment in a category that is all about judgment. So um, in other parts of our lives, I think there are, we, we sort of caution people against being too judgmental, right? You don't want to be too judgmental about your friends or your neighbors. But when it comes to dating, people judge the shit out of each other. And they feel totally justified in it. They think it's having high standards. They think it's standing up for yourself. But maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's something that needs to be unpacked about that. So um, I started um, what I call a project um, called Me So Far. And to me, it, the challenge was to design for dimensionality and gradual connection, the, the two things that I thought were really interesting when it came to you know, setting people up to meet each other. So here was the, the basic formula, and I played with this a lot. And this is important, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about event design. So um, we had 10 presenters. They would give five-minute presentations, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, there were 50 people in the audience, and it concluded with a 90-minute happy hour. Um, and the one thing, very important, is that it's a shared experience, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But um, this number is key. Um, I played around with the number a lot, and I realized that 75 was the absolute max for an event. And what I started to see was that um, 75 was that good number where people felt like they had choice. They felt like, oh, there's a lot of people in this room. But they would behave because they were going to run into that person more than once. It's very tricky. Once you get into the hundreds, anonymity starts to set in, and it, it changes the dynamic of a room. But if you keep a room small enough, that people feel like, oh, you know, I'm probably going to see that person again. They're not just going to be a face in the crowd. It absolutely changes the rest of the event. So I talked about how, you know, people gave slideshow presentations. And they got a list of prompts. And the, the basic idea behind these prompts was to get you to reveal yourself, not pitch yourself. And um, I think especially in the dating world, and, and actually in, in, in a lot of things, I think we live in a time right now where people feel like they have to pitch themselves. It's like you have to prove why somebody should spend time with you, whether it's the company that you work for, or how many Twitter followers you have, or how funny you are. I think there's an incredible um, propensity right now to, to pitch yourself, even if you don't mean it. And that's, that's definitely the case um, in, the, in the dating world. And so I, what my sort of, advice to people was, if you think it would be on your online dating profile, don't show it. If you think it's something that you would share later on or something that's, that wouldn't make it to your profile, that probably is a sign to you that it should be um, in your presentation. Um, it was funny, so I was, I was on the Cal train today and they had an accident and there was a whole thing, I'm sure some of you experienced that. And um, I ended up talking to a bunch of women on, on, the, on the train and I was like, oh, I really hope I'm not late for my talk. And they said, what are you talking about? And I started laughing because I was like, oh, man, this is going to open up a huge can of worms. And I'm, I'm, I got to, like, prepare for my talk. And I, I told them what I was talking about. And they were like, what are you going to say? And I was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, talk about a lot of different topics, like really, you know, good questions to unlock conversations. And they were like, what are they? Like, everyone just, like, leaned into me. What, what are those questions? And I said, um, I was like, you know, I'm not trying to withhold anything, but I go, I, I want to explain just, like, what, like, the why behind the questions, not just the what. And, we're, you know, like, it's, it's important to me, you know, like, I don't want to just, because I think sometimes when you, just, when you just, like, sort of slap things into people's hands, you also kind of want them to use it properly. So um, you're getting the questions, they didn't. That's all I'm going to say. So, <laughs> so I'm going to show you just a couple of them, and then actually I'm going to give you a chance to, to dive into this a little bit. So what do you like to do for fun? Standard first date question. Seems like a good idea. Seems like a valid thing to ask. That's a horrible question. And the reason is because it instantly puts somebody into pitch mode, the exact thing that I was talking about that you really don't want to get to. And, um, and it always just unearths the most uninteresting answers, right? Especially in the Bay Area. It's like, oh, I like to go to Napa. I like to hike, you know? And it's like, you're just going to get a bunch of blase stuff. Um, there were a lot of questions that we had that were designed to combat this, but I'm just going to show you a few, uh, one of them. Our version was, show us a screenshot of your credit card activity. Now, this was not to find out how much money you make. This was to find out what you actually did, because what you actually do 
is far more interesting than what you say you do. So when people started showing their credit card statements, and you know, they could blur out the charges, but you'd see like, oh, somebody went to Toys R Us, what was that about? Oh, I had to buy a gift for my nephew because he's turning five. Oh, I saw that you went to this spa. Oh yeah, my mom's birthday was last week and we went to go to the spa together. So what you're doing here is you're showing a piece of information that could be considered bland, but you're setting people up to have a conversation about it. And that's really huge, right? You just want to give enough so that someone's like, oh, I'm going to go ask that person about why they went to 7-Eleven 12 times in a week. And that, trust me, that happened a lot. I'm from Chicago. Okay. So another question, what are your interests, right? A cousin of that first question, but again, gets you into pitch mode. And our, we had a couple, again, a couple questions, but our version of that was show um, the browser history on your phone. Okay. So, which I realize could be a risky endeavor for some people. But um, what's interesting is the person who did this slide, he's actually, he's a data analyst. And I think, and I'm going to talk about job questions later, but, you know, especially, you know, you say data analyst, and it's kind of a, a, a one-dimensional look at somebody. But this was a far more interesting way of him saying he's a data analyst. He quantified his recent search history, and he got to say in a very honest and authentic way that he can cook, right? Instead of just saying, I can cook and I like to cook for people and I like to make you know, tahini from scratch, we've actually got evidence here, right? <laughs> big, big difference. Um, I did um, an event, one of my singles events for um, a 40 plus crowd. And this is one of the questions, what's, what's a domestic task you excel at? Um, and it's actually a great question because the boring stuff of your life is actually really interesting. So if you think about for a minute, like what's that domestic task that you really like, whether that's folding laundry or washing the dishes or finding random dust bunnies, like that stuff is actually super interesting and leads to great conversations. So anyway, so this guy said making cinnamon roll waffles for my kids. Okay, so first of all, like genius idea. Any of you that have children, this is a great thing. But it's a way for someone to say, I'm a single parent and I try to find ways to connect with my kids and showing it, right? Because I think especially when people have children, they worry about that, like, oh, I'm a single parent, and you know, what, what, what is that going to say about me? Versus like, you're a single parent, you're fucking awesome, like, celebrate that, you know? So this is a totally different way of announcing that news. So um, overall, the idea here was to create questions that beg for a story, not an answer. And that's huge, right? And if you ever think about what makes a good question, see if someone gives you an answer or a story, and that will probably start to give you an idea. So, ah, uh, the famous dating question, what do you do? And it's not just a dating question. It's a question that, you know, is, is pretty standard at parties, um, especially in the Bay Area. Um, and it's funny because what's, what's interesting is that here's a question that we ask everybody but across the board, job titles kind of suck, right? Like job titles are not a good indication of how interesting somebody is or what they do. And so you're putting this massive question against sort of an area of our lives that hasn't really developed, right? Especially if you're in sales or marketing or something that's just sort of very vague and ambiguous. So I have a couple of different questions for this. And I could, I could talk about this question alone for a while, but I won't do that. So two of the questions that I like to ask are um, what title would actually describe what you do or contribute at work? Um, when you ask a question like this, you're going to have someone say, you know what, like I created a new invoice system. And because of that, you know, things are like, like I shaved off 30 minutes off of everybody's, you know, like schedule. Um, and when have you felt really connected to your work? Like that's when, you know, the person who's a bartender is going to tell you about you know, how important they feel that they get to see everybody at 5 p.m. when they're at the end of their day and, you know, he or she is at the beginning of her day. Um, especially when it comes to jobs, we love to put people in a box and they will very, very happily sit in that box until we ask them the right question. And we really get to hear not just what their job is, but what, how they're interacting with the world. And so think about, you know, like I said, those job titles that are horrible, like accountant, sales, you know, caretaker, they just, they're so flat. And if you actually just unpack it a little bit, you're totally gonna get to a story. All right, this is one of my favorite questions, so listen up. Okay, 
big dating question. What's your family like? Are you close? Um, everybody wants to know this because you want to know, like, is this person come from a good family? Like, because I want to have a family. All right, here's the thing about this question. Everybody has a fucked up family, okay? <laughs> everybody has a fucked up family. Even if it worked out, it really didn't in a lot of ways, okay? <laughs> And family is such a loaded word, right? And because you, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's exclusive in so many ways. And especially right now when the entire notion of family is being redesigned, this seems like a very antiquated question, but a question we still reach for. So the question that I like to ask is, what was one really great thing about your upbringing? Um, and I want credit for this because it's awesome. So if you tweet about it, tag me. Okay, so the reason why this question is so great is because it totally changes the nature of the response, okay? So, um, because even if you didn't have a family, you definitely had an upbringing. And that's really, really important. So I wanna talk about this question because it's, it's how I think questions should be unpacked and, and constructed. So first of all, I, t I took family and turned it to upbringing. So you're, not talk you're talking about a formative period of time, not one definition of family. Um, great, do not use superlatives. I will talk about that later. Not a fan of superlatives. If you say great, you're picking from a wider range of things that people will select from. When you say things like favorite, best, worst, people are looking for the extreme of their experience rather than picking from a larger, a larger group. Um, you need a constraint, you guys know about that. So you don't want someone, you, want, you don't wanna say what was great about your upbringing because that's, that could just go in all sorts of pieces, in, in all sorts of ways. But you want them to focus on one thing. You want them to think about a big portion of their life but then identify one. Um, and this is really important, especially in dating. Um, you know, there, there, there can be that tendency to complain or whine, and not that there's anything wrong with that. People can connect over that. But you want to pivot people towards what, what's positive, but leave it open for them to talk about the stuff that was hard or the stuff that didn't work out. So when you ask a question like, what was one really great thing about your upbringing, these are the kinds of responses you'll get. So um, I was raised by my stepmother. But because of that, I learned that you don't need to be related to someone to feel a deep family bond. I shared a bedroom with four of my brothers. But because of that, I'm really good at making the most of my space. Like, that's very different than saying, are you close to your family? Because that's just going to be a yes or a no, and it's going bring it, to bring up a lot of stuff. But if you, say, well, if you ask this question, you're going to get a totally different response. And actually, on that note, because I'm feeling it right now, um, everybody pick a partner. You might have to get up, find a partner. Do a quick introduction. Quick introduction. Lakshmi, all right, stay up here, okay. Oh, nice, okay. All right, everybody, back up front. I know everybody's really interesting. Oh, nice. Okay. So um, usually I don't start with like deep questions like this, but we're going to go for it because it's late and it's a Tuesday. So um, uh, ask your partner this question. I'm only going to give you 90 seconds to do it, but just pick one thing that was good about your upbringing and share it with your partner. Okay? 90 seconds. Hi. Hi. You moved a lot. Yeah. I could have been terrible, but I somehow got off on that. Oh my so, God, that's you know, great. So I, okay. I, went to, I lived in 18 places before I was, you know, 18 or Oh my God, that's wonderful. Yeah, I love that. And you? Um, I have a couple of things. One of the things that I loved is my brother and I were really different and they did a really good job of not comparing us and really letting us be our own people. I think I actually put more pressure on myself to be like my brother, but my you. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Awesome.
question. I'm going to ask people to share out this one. So can I, can you? Okay, all right. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Nice, okay. Awesome, you guys did A plus on that. Um, uh, first of all, I saw a lot of I saw a lot of smiling, um, and I, I like I want to hear what happened out there, but I also want to hear if you think that you know you would have normally gotten to that that kind of information. So, can we just have a couple people share just really quickly who your partner was and what you what you learned about them? So you'll be sharing what your partner shared. Michael. Uh, Michael. This one will work here. I'll start with you. Oh, that there works. It there okay. it is. Uh, shared that uh, a love of people watching. That was one thing that was really great about, uh, about his upbringing. Nice. Okay. Very good. Anyone else? No one's so shy. <laughs> we were all talking a minute yes, ago. Yes, that one here. right there. And then we'll go, we'll go one, two. All right. Yeah. So, me. So uh, I was talking with Edwin, and he actually has a really different experience than I did because I grew up as an only child, but he grew up in a family of four older brothers or four, four younger brothers. So just having, wrapping my mind around always having someone about your same age around with you is always is kind of interesting, but really different than what I grew up with. So I nice. thought that was interesting. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. Okay, I talked with Kathy, and she talked about how it was great that she had an extended family, very large, and people of different ages, but being able to go through school with cousins that were in the same class as her and things like that, and that they would always go to her grandmother's house, and what was interesting for me was it brought up something for me that going to my grandmother's house was central to my family, and being able to be around all of our cousins, so that was pretty interesting. Thank you. Um Thanks for doing that. And, and one of the reasons why that, that question, I mean, it's, it's good to do in groups like this, but it's especially powerful when you're on a date because it, it creates this intimacy, which is ultimately what people want to get to. But it sets you up to have you know, a more intimate conversation. And for also for you to modulate, because you could have, I've heard people say, well, we always had cookies at home. Totally valid answer, right? And I've heard people say, you know, my stepmother raised me. And that was a very meaningful relationship that started out hard and, and, it, and it ended up really great. So you're not forcing people to share their deepest, you know, memories, but you're also creating an outlet for it if they decide to do that. And that's super important. Building that flexibility in questions um, can, can really, really change things. So um, these are words that I avoid at all cost when I'm designing questions. And the reason why, and I'm sure you've, you've done icebreakers and meetings or, you know, you're, you're, you're having a dinner party. And the reason why I don't like these words is because they lead to lazy questions. And, you know, it's just easy to be like, what was your favorite movie this year? You know, what's the worst restaurant in San Francisco? You know, um, and what you do is you start to create these lazy questions. And then more important, they're restrictive. So people are going, people are going to be like, oh, wait. The worst, you know, hold on. And then you actually end up killing the discussion. So what I like to say is superlatives are the worst. Okay, stay away from them, they're bad. 
Um, and like what, I, like like I said, it's not that it's it's just that if you sort of flex the question a little bit more and try to find words other than favorite, worst, and least, you will very likely get to a more interesting conversation. Okay, another thing that's big in dating is entertainment, right? Um, people love judging the shit out of each other based on what music they like, what movies they like, because if you, don't, God forbid, you both didn't go to Coachella, you know, you're not, you're not gonna work out as a, as a couple. And, um, and it's just so funny because people are looking for those, those incompatibilities when really it's a plus if you guys like the same music, but it's very, very not, it's not very often that is, it is a defining characteristic, it's a plus. So question that I like to ask when it comes to music is what's a song or artist that shaped your taste in music? And what's important about this question is that it gets people out of cool mode. A lot of people when they talk about their music and movie taste, they wanna be cool. They want you to think like, oh yeah, I, you, you like what Wilco said or why, you know? But when you ask a question like this, people will talk about like Britney Spears or Warren G or Boys to Men. And that is way, like promise me, like, that is a way more interesting conversation. Another, another question um, is uh, what's a song or artist you didn't expect to like? Um, the reason why that is so good, questions where somebody had to change their opinion about something is really, really great because you can kind of see how somebody arrived at one conclusion, got more information, and pivoted that opinion. And that is obviously huge for relationships because it's very likely that those two people are probably gonna change between day one and day 10,000. So understanding how someone has evolved their beliefs I think is really, really important. And more importantly, there is a natural story in that evolution. So nobody has to think about being interesting. If they tell you, why they were a Democrat and now they're an independent, um, or why they didn't like Aladdin, but now they love Disney movies. Is that Disney? Yeah, okay. So but that, that kind of like progression is a great way to get to know somebody. Um, words in questions, even the tiniest word, is really, really powerful. So when I first started doing me so far, this is a question I used to ask all of the presenters. What's something people tend to assume about you? And it's a great question in a lot of ways because it um, gets people to think about the assumptions and judgments they make and then maybe kind of rethink them. But then uh, um, I noticed it took people to a negative place. Even though I didn't mean it to happen, everyone was like, oh, people thought I was stupid or people thought that because you know, I was tall, I played basketball and all of these things. And I realized I was drudging up these negative memories, which is definitely not what I wanted to do. And then about a year later, I changed one word in the question. One word in this question, and it was a completely different question. Um, why do you think that is? I'd love to hear from you guys. I don't like to do all this. I was guessing admire instead of assume. That word did not change. It's tend to assume, to might. But thank you for speaking. I do appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Hey, a bunch of people talk about how they like to be seen or something they can imagine. Like, also, in the past, you, you really only notice people's assumptions when they turn out to not be a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. So this lets you talk about how someone could assume something about you that's right or great. Very good. Anyone else? Can you repeat that? Because that won't be on the recording. Repeat what? The response. He said that it allowed people to be aspirational about some of the things um, that they would, maybe would like people to think about them. Yeah, did you have your hand up? Yeah. It was just that tend is about fact and might is about possibility. Yes, exactly. So, um, and this was a huge revelation for me that this one word could send people on two totally different paths. And what I saw was that when you said, what do people tend to assume about you? People would, would reach for memory and when if you said might, people would reach for the hypothetical. And that is, you're gonna get a completely different answer and more importantly, 
what people, you know, the, the energy that they assume, they assume after they say that um, is going to be completely different. So you're not taking people back to a moment when they were judged harshly. You're taking them back to, they're, you're taking them to something that like, oh, that, that could be true. People could think this about me. Um, so we're going to do one quick thing, just because I think this, this question is really important. With your um, same partner, I just want you to answer this question. Again, 90 seconds. And you guys in the back, if you guys could sit closer to each other, I think it would be easier to, to answer some of these. This is like my favorite, my favorite all-time question, um, because it just oh, it, it it never it never fails to like do what it what it's intended to do. Um, can we get some people who haven't shared to share um, their response. Yes. Oh, you can actually tell us about you, you, not about your partner. But you're not. Got it. Very good. People might think I'm an extrovert. But you're not, as you as you assume the microphone. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Somebody else? You guys? Can you share? Okay. Just wait for the give two seconds for the microphone. Thank you. Share your own or share your partner's. It's fine. People tend to assume I'm 17 years old. <laughs> Wait, can you say, say, say like a few more things about that? Oh, well, I was just telling a story about how I donated blood down the street at Stanford and the nurse thought I was still in high school. <laughs> It'll happen. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, and that's also big. If, if someone does give you, especially as a researcher, you know this, if someone does give you an answer and you you want to hear more, you just ask for more, and people will usually, they, there's usually tons more behind that story. Um, two more. Let's, I would love to hear stuff. Something from this side of the room, this area, this geography right here. Yeah. So, 
So um, I've had to think about this answer before because it's on one of the online dating apps. Um, I think the, the way I answered it was people might think I'm really tough, but in fact I'm really sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think what's really nice is like that, that people think blank, but however, like that's the second part of the sentence. And I think it gets everybody thinking differently about, and it's, especially when you're dating, it's very hard to not be, be judgmental. I mean, the whole, the whole category is encouraging you to, to discard people and to think about things. But when you ask that question and you're proved, in that moment, you could be proved wrong or think differently, it changes, like I said, it, the same thing with the upbringing question, it changes the entire conversation that follows after that. One more and then I'll move on. My partner here says um, something people might assume about him is that he's much more conservative than he actually is. Why do people think you're conservative? Uh, just uh, either how I dress or how I'm usually more uh, listening type person. So I'm always just taking on the experience, uh, listening to different viewpoints and right. really not saying much because I know I'm an introvert. and just kind of Totally. Yeah, so I think um, quiet people and introverts like really benefit from this question because a lot of times I think, I've had so many people say like, well I have resting bitch face and people think that I'm mean, you know? And it's such a nice way for people to clear out whatever they think, you know, might be in the way of the interaction or the conversation. And it just, it literally clears the space in between two people. And it's, it's just a really nice like base to work from if you start from if you start from that, um, I'm not going to make you do this. But usually, what I like to do at this point is have everybody kind of, based on these principles, take sort of um, a typical dig site from dating conversation, like areas where you might dig when you're on a date, and think about the question that you would normally ask or the question that you think is standard, um, and then try to think of something that would do that sort of, you know, do that extraction that we've been talking about. Um, the event that I did for me so far, this was sort of the basic layout of the event, but this is what's really important is, um, you know, at different points in, the, in an event, you're, you're dealing with different, different user, user needs, user challenges. So for singles events, there's a lot that is actually done before the event. Um, in order to calm nerves, get people to show up. There's huge, typically there's huge, there can be huge drop off at, at singles events. And so we do a lot of, I would do a lot of stuff with like, you know, pre-event priming and emails and, you know, really making people understand that they are absolutely a part of the event and they are, they are vital to it. Um, the next thing is when you walk into an event, the first thing you're gonna do is judge, like I said, judge the shit out of people. And what are things that you can do, like I said, to slow that down, delay that judgment? Um, and then, you know, next, you know, we've been talking a lot about conversation. So how do you set people up to not have those standard conversations? Geographic movement, that's the first thing that we did tonight. Um, people are going to camp out in the space. And unless you do something to make sure they don't camp, set up camp, um, they're going to stay there. So how can you get people mo moving around the room? And in a way that is, you know, supportive of them and not, you know, dictatorial. Because nobody wants that either. You know, it's like, how do you inspire people to move around, not force them to move around? Um, and then follow-up momentum is really key. Like, you know, a lot of people meet each other, but then, you know, creating reasons and activities for people to make sure that they follow up, which is huge in dating. Um, the other thing that I like to, I really like to think about when I'm, when I'm doing events is um, how, do you, how do you create artifacts, right? So artifact creation is huge. You know, we know that that, that is when you have a culture, right? You have language, you have you know, relationships, and then you have artifacts that are left behind. Um, so one of the things I did for one of my events that was called Workaholics is I had everybody turn their phone in, which probably isn't a very novel idea now, but in, 20, in 2012 it was pretty cool. Um, so having everybody put their phone down and putting their name on it, and it did a couple of things. One, there was this massive table with all of you know, these phones lined up. So it was like everybody was a part of this you know, kind of any piece of artwork. And then more importantly, it got people to talk about how they were doing without their phone. You know? And that instantly you know, became a genuine piece of conversation. Well, how are you doing? Like, 
I'm worried someone from work might be trying to get me, you know, get me, but really I'm, what I, what's bothering me is that I can't tweet about this, you know? So, you know, you just instantly you're giving people who may not, you know, normally have something to talk about, have like a real live experience, like a real, you know, emotional and real reaction to something, and then being able to talk about it um, in a genuine way, instead of, you know, talking about random things. Um, I'm not gonna do this right now, but uh, I do a lot of things with the phone. To me, I think people are a little bit too um, quick to say that the phone has you know, separated people. It's like anything else. Like if something, if you, if you see something is getting in the way of things, rethink it, you know? Think about how, okay, it seems divisive, but what are, what are a bunch of ways in which I could take this thing, but then actually use it to make people talk rather than you know, something that divides them. Um, I'm gonna skip uh, one thing, okay. So the other thing is, um, you know, when you're designing an event, there's all of these huge, like these details that can, if you rethink them, you know, how can you make them, you know, more, um, like I said, designed for the intended interaction. So one reality of singles events in particular is the dreaded name tag, which, you know, at, at other events isn't that big of a deal, but at a singles event, it can feel like you are being, oops, sorry. <laughs> like you are being slapped um, you know, sort of like branded as a single person. And so what's really important, I realized in that moment, it wasn't to, to, to get rid of the name tag. It was to make sure that people put it on themselves and that it was distributed at the midpoint of the event and not at the beginning. Because if you kick off an event where everybody has a name tag, then it feels like you're at a singles event. If you distribute name tags the middle and let people put it on, suddenly it's not, it's, it is a true identifier as opposed to something that's just been imposed on you. Um, another thing um, that I learned was, like I said, all of these things that we think are bad for events, if we retool them, can actually be really good. So um, one thing I noticed is one of my events, I only had one bartender, and so they're starting to develop, you know, um, uh, sort of a line at the bar. And in any other, you know, context, that would be seen as a bad thing. Like, oh my God, people are waiting for their drinks, that's so bad, that's so bad. But what I started to notice is like that actually became a time when people started talking. Even if it was to bitch it about me, um, <laughs> they were talking. <laughs> Can't believe she only has one bartender. Um, but what I started to do is I started to have all of my events with just one bartender. Because I realized that that time was actually super valuable when people were kind of huddled around the bar and even if they were a little frustrated. And then at the midpoint, I would announce what I was doing and then people felt actually like, oh, that was intentional. And then when it becomes intentional, like everyone starts to see it as like, oh, this is part of the event. It's not someone didn't plan for us, someone actually did plan for us. Um, so the other thing is like, like, like I always say, like when you see something going wrong at an event or what seems to be going wrong, there's probably something in there that's actually going right. And if you can dig out what that thing is, you can start to make that you know, a tool for future things. Um, sorry, I need to do this. Um, okay, so the other thing was I talked about that core event with the, with the presenters and the, the presentations and the happy hour. But then what I started to realize is, you know, themes are really important. And so, but the themes needed to be based on real things that were happening in the dating world. So um, I'm from Chicago. It's really cold in Chicago. So one thing that I would do is to really find out, like, what makes dating in Chicago a challenge? And how can I design for that? So um, the other thing is, if any of you are familiar with Chicago, it's hard, actually pretty hard to date across subway lines. The red line and the blue line are the main arteries of the CTA system. And interestingly, they, they only intersect at one point all the way downtown. So if you live on the red line and you meet someone cute on the blue line, good luck. Like, it's gonna, it's gonna be like having a long distance relationship. So. Um, <laughs> I did this event in the dead of winter, and it was called Red Line, Brown Line. Um, and the red and the brown lines are, t are, they actually, they have, I think, like six transfer points, depending on where they are at right now. And so if you meet someone on this line, it's gonna be easier to get to them. And also in Chicago, where you, what stop you live off of is like a huge point of pride. You know, you wanna tell people about how that, you know, why, the, why your stop is the best and why the restaurants are great. So a lot of the questions for this event were around people sharing their pride around their stop. So when people, on their name tags, people had their name, and then they had the stop that they lived off of. And that is instantly a piece um, of connection. So um, 
when I think about what this event did, like all of these different factors and you know, having people tell stories, not you know, just share their pitch points, um, I think the real impact of it was what I call the me so far effect. And that is that you know, every month, you know, I used to think I was in competition with online dating. And then I realized that actually these offline experiences are hu a huge support to online dating experiences because you're giving people, you know, a, you know, a way to like go between the two. And so I used to sort of think of myself as this, this event coordinator who was putting 60, you know, sort of fresh faces, literally fresh because they would feel differently after the event, fresh faces back into the dating pool. And as we know, when you put in one person who's feeling more open, asking better questions, not pitching themselves, it has a ripple effect. Um, I'm going to talk about one last event that I did. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of them. But again, this idea of taking an insight about dating and then developing, you know, des designing around it. So I wanted to do an event that actually brought together couples and singles because that's not something that we think of when we think of dating. We think it's something that is just something single people do and you know, people in relationships, they're, they're like way over here. Um, so the, the, the design challenge here was couples want to help and advocate for their single friends but don't know how. I mean, we, we, are, we always like hear this, like, oh, if I knew anybody or I don't even know what to do, like, do I give them your number? Like, how do I, how do I orchestrate this? So the insight here was that people are toasted at weddings and funerals, the moments when they're not on the market. You know, like you'll be at a wedding and they'll be like, oh my God, Bob is so great and he helped me in this. And I'm like, Bob just got married. Like, I don't want to hear about Bob. I want to hear about people that, you know, I can still date. And the other time we celebrate Bob is when he's dead, you know, and we're talking about how wonderful this person was and why don't we talk about how great people are when they're actually alive and available. And so um, the solution to this was the, probably the biggest event I ever did, and it was called Meet My Amazing Friend Night. And the idea here was to take the slideshow presentations and put it in the hands of couples. So couples told the story of their favorite single friend and got to share things that, you know, people usually don't get to say about themselves. And it was a true toast. Um, and so um, it was just, it was absolutely wonderful to hear people say these things about their friend. And a lot of times the friends would say, I didn't even know, I didn't even know that I supported you guys that way. I mean, especially for couples, you know, they love their single friends so much and they don't see them as defective. They see them as these amazing people and it was a chance for them to actually say all those things that, you know, there's not necessarily a forum for. So um, it was fantastic. So you see the presenter up front and then you see the person being toasted in the back. So they can't really say anything. They just have to kind of accept all the adulation coming their way. Um, I talked earlier about you know the importance of geographic movement. So you know at every event I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And so at this event, every presentation concluded with a toast, as you would at a wedding. You know, so raise your glass to not Bob, someone else, Michael. All right, raise your glass to Michael. And what happened is what I asked people to do is for every at the conclusion of every toast, I ask them to toast somebody new. So you can imagine what that looks like. So for toast one, you can just clink glasses with the person next to you. But by toast 10, you have to get up, you have to move around, you might have to find somebody in the balcony. And so what happens is the room expanded and contracted over the night multiple times. So you, you would actually be moving around and you would see somebody and maybe you'll get them the next time around but it got everybody to move around and that's really, really important um, at an event. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this because um, what, one thing I like to do with, with groups is sort of give them event design challenges and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna make you do this, but just a really simple framework. Like I like to sort of lay up, here's an event design challenge, what would you do with it? And um, I think everybody has events or you know, you know, in-person experiences and I think we think like, oh, it's just, you can't do anything. People are going to be people. But it's not true. Like even, I think we think a lot about interaction design when we think about online experiences. I think we're very, very comfortable with that. But there's so many things that can be done in even our everyday spaces, whether that's on a train or whether that's at a conference. And those little things that you can do, even at your office, you know, birthday party, 
There's little things that you can do that can absolutely transform the impending interaction. So um, I'll just tell you, this is like, so this is some of the stuff that I, that I think about. I, I told you how you know, the lack of interaction drives me nuts. So I like to give people sort of like hypothetical case studies. So this is one. All right, and you can all probably all relate to this. Since Delightful Tavern opened in 1994, things have changed. Management has succumbed to the craft cocktail movement, and now bartenders are so focused on herbs and syrups, they can't dedicate as much time to social engineering at the bar. Develop a few simple tactics the bartender can use to make sure that the craft of the cocktail doesn't destroy the craft of conversation. And this is funny, and I, you know, I remember like saying this, everybody was like, oh my God, that's right. Yeah, like I went to a bar the night and there was 15 ingredients in my drink, and I never actually got to like talk to the bartender. And that's actually something that's been lost. If anyone was a bartender even like six years ago, it was a completely different vocation to what it is now. Now you have to like, you know, have like a garden over here, and then <laughs> all of your potions here because that's just where it is. But th in the process of us becoming addicted to craft cocktails, you will, if you actually look in bars now, you will see, I mean, I'm not saying this is everywhere, but I'm saying like there has been that loss of the bartender just kind of hanging out and you know, getting to know you and saying, hey, have you, met, have you met this person over here? And so you know, like I see that and like my first instinct is like, oh my God, how can we, how can we make that better? And so I like to, to serve it up as a, as a challenge to people. Um, I have a couple of other cases, but we are running short on time, and so what I was going to do is actually just end now um, and take your questions. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. <laughs> uh, this is less of a question and more something I wanted to share. So you'd mentioned maybe six, seven slides back, about uh, taking something like a phone, which can be very divisive, that people are looking at their phones, and turning it into a tool. Uh -huh. And I heard a really cool trick that you can use if you're doing a class or something and you want to bring people out of their shells, that you have people uh, find a, f a photo on their phone, show it to the person next to them, and have the person next to them guess what the photo is and what the context is that the photo was taken in. Yeah. And it sort of, it sort of starts a story going it, it combines the what might this be that Rob was talking about with the reality that you then say what it was and the story that comes out of it. Right. And it, it's kind of a fun thing to do. It, that's more of a class thing, but I figure it works here too. No, it's actually it was in here. I just skipped over it. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, I have okay. a couple of versions of that. Yeah, I've been doing that for a couple of years, and it's great because especially it's, it's also it's very personal. Like, cause you, it's instantly personal because you took that picture, and you wouldn't have taken that picture unless it meant something to you, whether it was to remind you of something or whether it was a memento. But yeah, that's a hugely, hugely powerful tactic. So this probably predates your time in Chicago, but I'm from Chicago, and uh, <coughs> my husband and I and I met at Gail Prince's party mix. If that, nope, okay, you, you just went where, what? <laughs> but we we did eventually bond for t and has continued our relationship for 22 years over. What kind of food do you like? Italian food, and and the geographic moving people into different parts of the room and then having them all, everybody talk to each other. So it works. Yeah. So here we go, one testimony. I can't resist asking you this question. It's a classic. You've got um, a couple getting married, they're deeply in love, and their families have nothing in common. Mm -hmm. So other than forcing them to have to sit to together and not one side has this family and the other, the reception, how do you get these people to actually break the ice and talk to each other? Okay, yeah, you want a great dance band, but still, surely you have some other ideas. So the question is, how do you get warring in-laws to... Uh, Isolated in-laws, you know. Isolated in-laws. I mean, you know, that's one of those things, I think you really have to talk to the couple. Like, you could force, like, I could give you a couple of things that would get them talking. But I think that's one of those things, and I actually did this, like my best friend got married in July, and um, I was really like, t like, that's something where you investigate, like truly investigate what's going on in the relationship. Not, not the dark secrets, but like, what are things about these two people? Um, and then I think designing an experience around that. Um, it could be as simple as getting them to write a toast together, 
a quick toast together about the couple, right? So getting them to focus on something positive. Um, that would be just like one thing like off the top of my head. Um, and then, you know, I think there's, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, s people switching seats in between courses um, at weddings and things like that, like just getting people to move around. Um, I think food is something that people talk about, but then they also tend to get really focused on their food. So um, that would be my first reaction to that question. But then after that, yeah, I just, I feel like, I, I think family dynamics are interesting and I think you have to dig in to find out what's really going on. I was wondering um, in your event timeline what the lightning round was for? The lightning round, okay, so good, good eye, wow. Um, so the, the lightning round was intended to balance out the, 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 the presenters talking so much. So the presenters are talking and they're sharing their story, but there's 60 people who don't get the chance to be a presenter. So at the midway point, I would do a lightning round where everybody put their name in a hat and then they would rapid fire answer questions that appeared on the screen. And some of them were questions that the presenters had answered, but a lot of them were, were, there were they were questions designed for quick retrieval. So stuff that you don't have to think about a lot, and that's why, hence the, the, the term lightning round. So there's different categories of questions. Like these are, a lot of the questions I showed you today are stuff that you probably have to ponder for a little bit. But there's a lot of questions that you should be able to answer right away and you don't have to think about too much. And so I would pick those kinds of questions for the lightning round. And it gave a chance for everybody to answer some questions and not just the presenters. Like something as simple as um, you're ordering a pizza and you can have three toppings. Go. Um, what's the last food item that you let spoil? Um, what did you do last Saturday? How did you deal with the Hawks winning? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So how did you know, like? How did you celebrate something that just happened? What you know? Something that so no one has to think very hard, but they can. But it still is illustrative of the person that they are. Mm -hmm. So I love the principle of avoiding superlatives. The idea of not making it seem like each question is going to be something deep and immutable about you that you can be judged on. <laughs> but I'm curious when when you get people to avoid that, what do they judge each other on? Like what kinds of things come out of these storytelling questions that you found do? Uh, determine whether people hit it off or not? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you'll never really, really know. I mean, all you're really trying to design for is for people to have a better conversation than they would have otherwise. I mean, as far as like hitting it off, I mean, you know, you hope, but you don't, people don't report back necessarily on those things. But um, I think, uh, like I said, like a lot of these questions, I talked about important, important like periods of transition or pe things that people change their mind about. Um, and even like creative questions. Like I had this one question that was like, if you could, it was for an event we did called Nerd Alert, and it was like, if you could design a convention um, on the topic of your choice and come up with like the schedule and the itinerary, people got really into this, you know? And so they actually got to be creative about things. And so you're setting people up to have conversations based on like stuff that, that has actually pulled their personality out. Did that, does that answer your question or not quite? Somewhat, Somewhat? okay. I'll go with someone. Yeah. Um, I was wondering. This should be on. I was wondering about like the. Uh, um, um, there are now certain organizations that actually put events into into uh, uh, dating and stuff like that, or or bring social things together. Like you probably heard like uh, events and adventures and and uh, other uh, like uh, sports leagues like. Uh -huh. uh, like kickball or or right. or dodgeball. Like um, I belong to one, and afterwards they go to the bar. And would you say that 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 has changed the dating world as far as like it adds that that um, item of hey, we just had a kickball game, so now we can talk about it at, and then that opens it up to those to those types of things that you were talking about. Those types of questions. Yeah, I mean some more directly than others, you know, like that could be enough for somebody. We just played a kickball game. Some, some people might need a little bit more than that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's always good if you're doing something where you're not so actively, just like, like all you're thinking is about is, is this person someone I'm going to date? Like if there's something to distract you from that or even just put, that, put the brakes on that, I think that's always a good thing. Yeah, and then there's degrees of it, right?
So it was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. So a couple of questions for you. So I'm visualizing this room with 75 people. And uh, why is it that just a few of them get to be presenters? Um, and the rest of them, you know, probably 60 of them are sitting listening. Um, and my second question is, what's your success rate? How has it worked out for all of them? OK. So I'll take, I'll take your first question. Um, there's actually n none, none of that. First of all, people, people, not everybody wants to present, right? So the people that are taking, to doing the presenting, they're taking a massive risk. And there's actually an appreciation in the audience that person is doing that. Um, and so, you know, higher risk, higher reward. If you, if you take that chance, you're going to probably get more attention. And I think that's, people accept that, right? And then the other thing is that um, I told you about the lightning round. That balances things out a lot, too, because all of a sudden, probably at that point, 60% of people have shared in some form. And then there's a lot of sharing that goes on that is, is you know, kind of like on the side. And then we've curated the size so that at some level, everyone kind of feels a little bit special and taken care of. Um, so that's what it is. And I don't think, you know, events are about making everyone feel exactly the same. I think it's about coming in with like a point of view and then, you know, executing on that point of view. Um, and then your second question was success rates. So um, in dating in general, I think success is like a hard, a hard thing to measure. First of all, people don't report back on their dating lives very often. They disappear. Um, and that's okay. The things that you can measure, so I always, you know, I did lots of surveys, um, really trying to understand if people would recommend the event, you know, net, pro net promoter score, and then definitely trying to measure for connection. Like, even if you didn't meet the person you're going to, you know, be in a long-term relationship with, like, did you meet someone that you think you'll follow up with? You know, because that, that's really all that people can gauge. People can't go to an event and be like, yeah, I met my future husband. Like, that's a really hard thing to, to evaluate. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, a lot of this is like anecdotal. Like, um, I would hear like, you know, months down the road that, that, that those people are still together or that they're best friends or, you know, whatever. And I think, you know, like a lot of people like want metrics when it comes to this category. And it's probably one of the hardest categories to have metrics in. I just have a quick Chicago question for you. Bring it you on. had you talked about how you had the uh, <laughs> the red line brown line, mm -hmm. and then you mentioned that how you, they would have um, their stop on there. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think about maybe putting on uh, either Cubs or White Sox? Yeah, I definitely you know thought of you know I didn't want to start a fight. <laughs> Violence, no. no. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, things that, you know, I, I definitely played with a lot of different themes, but I always wanted the themes to be something that was a positive union and not a source of tension. Might you share one rescue topic in an awkward situation? Right. <laughs> Wait, what? What's a the rescue to a topic. What's a rescue topic? Something to get you out of an awkward situation and you don't know what to say and now you have to create a new conversation with somebody. What's a I good would say, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if you're in an awkward situation, I mean, I, I have awkward conversations all the time. And I think the best thing is like, oh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, or think of something that you don't know about that person, which is probably a lot, given most people in the world. If you're just something you don't know and, and go from there. Even like, where are you going? What did you do last night? When was the last time you were hung over? You know, you can like think of degrees of just stuff that you probably don't know about the other person. Um, so we've been talking a lot about how do you open up a conversation? How do you talk more? Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering like, how do you close a conversation? For example, you have to really you're not interested in that person or just want to talk to someone else? You know, switch to another table. Yeah, so um, what I, I do is at my events, I actually orchestrate moments for that to happen. So I'll be very open. I'll be like, okay, whoever, like, you know, we have 30 minutes left of the event. Um, there's probably people you haven't met. So we suggest closing out that conversation. Um, what if there's no facilitator? 
Or what if there's no facilitator? We're just free form. Just that's why I design events. Like, that's just life. You're talking about life. I can't design everything for that. Um, um, I mean, I think, you know, leaving conversations, uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, polite ways to do that. I mean, I, I would say in general, like, it's best not to lie. Whatever, whatever it is, like, don't lie. Just, I think the easiest thing is, um, there are several people at this party that I that I wanted to talk to tonight. It's been lovely talking to you. Um, I'll see you again later. That's usually a pretty a pretty good one. Does that work for you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I'm the one that she talked to tonight. <laughs> what? I'm the one that she talked to tonight. Oh, so she's trying to get out of that conversation. <laughs> oh, so it totally I would worked. get up and go to the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a, a, a common a question yeah. for the question about the assumption question. That I uh, tend to and uh, might ass assume some person to be something. Um, well, yeah, we both feel that felt that it doesn't change that much to 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 to, to the question and I. Actually, I felt it change, but then when I answered the question, it actually fetched for my bad memories. Oh yeah, people assume me assume me to be, to be this, but I'm actually that. I guess it's more towards the tone that you present the question. If you show caring, that the other person might take the opportunity to opportunity to 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 get the comfort. Like, yeah, I got the misconception all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're talking about is the delivery of the question, and that's huge because you can do like. So what's some of the things people would tend to assume about you, right? You can play Sherlock Holmes and get ready to, you know, put somebody in the corner. Or you can be like, so what, what's something that people might or tend or could assume about you? Yeah, you know, I guess but the again, attitude. that's life. <laughs> There's what do you do for a living and what do you do for a living? You know, uh. I mean, that's just <laughs> like who you are, you know, so you can't. I can't, you know, all of these things are questions, and then it's act, it's in the hands of the individual person to deliver that. But yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that you know, um, there's there's huge huge consequences to how a question is delivered. Yeah, Absolutely. I just feel that question is too risky. <laughs> that question is too risky. Yeah. yeah, well, maybe you should start with one of the starter questions, like mm. what's your, what's what's your favorite cereal or something. Like that. <laughs> No, but I agree. Like some of these questions, they do need to be handled carefully, and I think your your point is well taken. Okay. Thank you, and I'd like to thank uh, Lakshmi very much for sharing her experiences with us.